Thomas, one of the most respected voices in the Indian stock markets, Nilesh Shah, MD of Kotak Mutual Funds, is now with us on the show. Thank you so much for taking us, taking out time for us, Mr. Shah. Pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, an average investor who has been burnt between in, between 2008 to let's say for some time lost a lot of money is now worried about is valuations. Everyone has heard that you must buy value. There's so much talk about it. How does one go about looking for that in this market? So one, people must appreciate that this is not a value market. This is fair value or fair value plus market. The value market was there in 2000 and probably 14 when the government was getting formed. It was there probably in Feb 2016 when the budget came. But today, when the market is almost nearing all-time high, there is very, very limited value left in the any sector. Mm -hmm. Now people will have to pay the full price and participate in the growth. Mm -hmm. It is the growth market investment rather than buying things at bargain. Mm -hmm. There is no despair. There is hope. Mm -hmm. All right. Just to break that down for our viewers again, you essentially mean that in 2014, you were getting things cheap. Now you're not going to get it cheap anymore. They, you're going to pay what, it's the, what is the value. And then whatever gains they're making in earnings, that will translate into stock price growth at more or less the similar rate. Is that a fair way to look at it? That's absolutely the fairest way to look at it. Mm. Now, this is one caveat that this is broad market. Mm. There might be one or two stock which will be available at a bargain. Mm. But you'll have to really you know, find that like a needle in the haystack. Hmm. Okay, I want to uh, understand how a person like you, how your mind works when you're looking at stocks. And I understand, obviously, you cannot be stock specific uh, in terms of what you're buying and doing. But how do you, how do you look at a stock? Uh, it's a brilliant question. And very rarely we get asked this question. Everyone wants to, you know, find a fish rather than figure out how to do fishing. So many, many thanks for asking the question, how to do fishing rather than give me a fish. Uh, for us, there are three or four characteristics which is very, very critical. The first characteristic is, will this business generate free cash flow? Mm. I don't want to invest in a business which is going to demand my cash. I want to invest in a business which throws cash which gives me dividend, which reinvests into its own business for growth, which doesn't dilute itself frequently. Mm. Now, obviously, there are exceptions in banking and financial services where growth requires its own capital. Mm. But other than that, I want to invest in companies where there are less dilution, which are free cash flow generating, and which throws dividend back to the shareholders. Mm. The second thing which we are more bothered about is, is this free cash flow sustainable? Now, it's possible for a company to generate free cash flow once or twice in a row simply because markets are favorable. But when markets are not favorable, especially in commodities, mm. then that cash flow disappears. So we want to invest in a business which is sustainable, where there is enough moat, where there is enough uh, you know, constraints or restrictions, mm. which does not create free competition. Okay. The third thing which is important for us is the governance. I mean, if we find a business which is free cash flow generating, which is sustainable, but if we end up with a promoter who is not going to share that benefit with you as a minority shareholders, there's no point in investing with them. So we need to invest into companies which are governed properly and where the wealth creation will be shared equally between the promoters and the minority shareholders. The fourth thing then which comes into play is the valuation. Now, I may find a great business, it has perfect mode, it has free cash flow, it is a great promoter. But if he's asking too much of a price, then obviously my returns, my future returns will come down. So if I can get something at a reasonable valuation, it's a great opportunity to invest. Now, obviously, you don't get all these combinations at one go. There are very rare times, like in 2014 or 2016, where you had less money and more opportunities to invest. Many a times you confront with more, uh, you know, less opportunities and more money. So then you have to create the balance in descending order where you compromise on one thing but don't compromise on others. So it's a everyday evolving process 
but essentially it's all about free cash flow, good governance, promoter willing to share wealth with minority shareholders, sustainable generation of profit and valuation. Okay, let me start with the last point, valuation. Now, if I look at valuation, then a lot of stocks look expensive and actually have historically looked expensive. Every time I've uh, tried to look at the numbers of Asian paints, it has always relatively looked expensive. And a lot of times, a lot of market players tell you, oh, you know, you should have got this earlier. Now it's too expensive. And in hindsight, it is not, it wasn't expensive, <laughs> right? So I know you can't talk specifically about Asian paints, but I look at a counter like that, or even let's say something like, uh, you know, uh, some of those NBFCs, which are really expensive, were expensive one year ago. And one year down the line, you think, oh, you know, probably it was a mistake to think that it was expensive. So how do you look at it? Because in Indian markets, the expensive stocks appear to be delivering constantly. So definitely beauty is in the eye of beholder. Valuation is all relative. Now one valuation parameter which most common investors are familiar with is price to earning ratio. But then we also have to understand that price to earning ratio is not in totality the only valuation tool. There is something related to you know, future cash. Now probably a company X is today showing depressed profitability because it's investing into brand promotion, it's investing into building of brand, which over a period of time they'll be able to monetize. Mm. So certainly on a past performance basis, the earnings will look expensive, mm. but on the future, if they monetize that investment, certainly earnings will look far better and hence the future P ratio will look on the lower side. The second thing is related to growth. Mm. Now, if a company is growing at 25% per annum, maybe the PEG ratio will be more appropriate rather than let's say price to earning ratio alone mm. because growth over a period of time will compound earnings at a much faster pace mm. and deliver you better return. Mm. The third thing is related to kind of competitiveness or the leadership valuation premium which you want to give. Mm. Now invariably in a sector the person who is leader he gets a high valuation. Right. So valuation on a price to earning basis alone is not the tool. You have mm. to look at how that earnings is going to come mm. and how it's going to shape up in the future. If you are sure about uh, uh, sustenance of that earning, mm. you don't mind paying a little premium. Mm. All right, let me take these three for our viewers. You've mentioned one is how much future cash it's going to generate and you think that it's going to be sustainable. Then you said look at the PEG ratio. If something is going at 25 times, 25% uh, per annum and you're paying 25 times that much and something is growing at 10% annum per annum and you're paying 15 times, actually the 25% growth company, even if it looks more expensive, is actually better. So PEG ratio better than PE. Uh, do you think that, you know, now that I talk to uh, people like you who are at the top of the, uh, the entire investment process of, uh, of India's capital markets, I'm seeing increasingly a move towards free cash flows, towards return ratios, looking at ROE, ROC, and increasingly um, many of you don't talk any longer of our price earnings ratio. Is that a fair comment to make? So we also have evolved in this market. When we started our career, you know, right straight from school and colleges, we thought P ratio was the most important thing. Over a period of time, we made lots of mistakes and realized that P ratio was not necessarily the best thing. Mm. The PG, the price to book value in certain respect, mm. the price to free cash flow, the earnings yield, different parameters kept on coming in. And it's investment is an art, it's not a science. Mm. So there is no one fixed rule. Mm. The market always keeps on teaching you new things every day. And while many of you refer to us as, you know, top of the investment process, market masters, market gurus, in reality, we are all students of the market. We still make mistakes. We still get slapped by the market every day. The only thing which we try to do, let our, you know, errors be smaller and let our rational decision be higher. We are all students of the market and learning. There's no final word on valuation. Because again, when one looks at the past uh, P historical P ratios of, let's say, market P ratio, and looks at 2007, that was a really inflated period. 
And at that time, a lot of people who were investing were talking, saying that, you know, you're investing in growth. These are not companies which are going to give you cash immediately. And therefore, the valuation needs to be on the sum of the parts, on the assets they hold, uh, total land value, land bank, uh, replacement cost for power companies. Those have seemed to have been completely gone. They've gone out of the uh, you know, window now. Everyone's now looking at things where there is cash flow. Is that, again, a fair way to look at it? Undoubtedly, in 2000, uh, many of us invested in companies just because they changed their name from XYZ Finance Limited to XYZ Infotech Limited. Mm -hmm. Many of us invested in companies which were, you know, available at very, very high valuation on a growth which was not sustainable. In 2008, we learned from that error and ensured that we didn't invest in any businesses which were not real, which were existing on paper, but not in real life. But we made the error of paying very high valuation for growth. In infrastructure companies, we ended up picking up companies which we thought will continue to grow at rapid pace. We almost assumed that India's growth rate will be equivalent to China's growth rate for decades to come. Now, in the middle of 2008, somewhere in the September-October period, we realized that paying too much of valuation for a business which is dependent upon government policies, which is dependent upon market environment, is not appropriate. They need to be discounted separately. Mm. Now, in 2016, based on the 2000 and 2008 experience, we are all focused on businesses which are free cash flow generating, which have sustainable cash flow, which have some sort of competitive advantage through soft branding power. Mm -hmm. The one risk which we continue to battle today, and maybe in 2024 we'll say that, okay, we didn't manage that risk well or we managed that risk well, is the power of disruption coming through technology. Right. We are investing today in banks, but who knows tomorrow something will emerge and destroy the business model of the bank. Uh, DBS, which is the largest bank in one of the largest bank in Southeast Asia, mm. raised uh, raised 200 billion dollar deposits in a 50 year time frame with so many branches. Mm. Alipay reached there in just one year. Mm. So we need to be constantly aware of this disruption which is going to come through technology, mm. and we'll have to factor that into our portfolio. And as of today, you know, we are learning how to measure this technological disruption. Mm. Maybe five, ten years down the line, the guys who will be able to manage technological disruption mm. will be a better fund managers, and the guys who won't be able to manage that will probably fall by the wayside. All right, I'm going to take the four investment uh, criteria that you've given us and uh, try to see whether that can be used for one particular company which is not listed in India. All right, so this is, will this business generate uh, free cash flow will this business give uh, sustained free cash flow then governance uh, now i'm assuming that when you look at governance issues one has to have a bit of a history of the promoter to know what they've done in the past and then valuation how would you use these at all to let's say buy uber if you had to so one i must accept that i have very limited idea about uber I'm a consumer of Uber, but I have zero idea about their business model. I do know that they have incurred almost $1.5 billion loss, mm. but I don't know how they have incurred that. Mm. Now, unless until you meet the management, mm. unless until you have their business model, mm. unless until you have gone through their financial statement, mm. don't make the risk of you know, investing into that company. Mm. You may miss a great opportunity, mm. but more often than not, you will save a big fortune. Mm. So unless until I meet the management of Uber, mm. unless until I have access to their financial statements, mm. unless until I can understand what their business model is, mm. I'm not going to venture into making investment into that company, mm. even if it means that I may lose a multi-bagger opportunity. I was using Uber as a, more as a, let's say, as a sign or a symbol for anything which is a future growth company. You know, a lot of them come with, I'm sure they have come to you as well, and uh, many of them are probably not listed, but you are aware of it. They go to bankers and they come with Excel sheets saying that I'm going to break even in year seven, and from year eight, I'm going to basically have uh, free cash flow, positive free cash flow. Now, perhaps they will, but uh, uh, is, is it an issue of 
once bitten, twice shy? Are, are the markets now, at least in the listed space, no longer betting on things which are going to generate free cash flow eight years, nine years, ten years down the line? Uh, it's not that listed market will not uh, invest in companies which are going to generate cash over a period of time. Mm. If you remember uh, telecom sector when it you know, came for listing, mm. uh, I mean, they were loss making companies, mm. but there was pot at the end of the tunnel, there was a light at the end of the tunnel and market was more than happy to invest into it. Mm. And over a period of time, they did create enough opportunity for shareholders. Mm. So we want to invest in companies which are growth oriented, even if they are loss making today, but I should know with certainty that they are going to make profit over a period of time. Right. I mean, such kind of companies, you don't put all the money at one go. Mm. You seed that company, see whether whatever they are talking is getting converted into numbers or not. Mm. And once you feel comfortable that, yes, these numbers are coming, you mm. start increasing your bet. Uh, there's no point in, you know, buying one uh, monkey hoping that it will become King Kong because you are so comfortable with it, because you are mm -hmm. nourishing it so well, because okay. you are putting all your bets onto it. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to have lot many monkeys in your portfolio. Yeah. Some of them will become gorilla. Mm -hmm. Keep on investing in them and one of them will become King Kong. Right. <laughs> okay. Right now it appears that you'll have to uh, pay for gorilla at gorilla rate, right? Because you were saying that now it's a fair value market. Uh, so should one... Um, Except that in a fair value market, when you invest, the price at which you are buying today is not going to generate a multi-bagger. Is that a fair thing to say? Uh, this will apply for the broad market. Mm. And I think it's important for people to realize that Sachin Tendulkar didn't become greatest cricketer of the world by hitting every ball for a four and a six. Mm. In fact, uh, probably more than 60% of the balls which he faced, he simply scored no run. He just stayed on the wicket. Mm. With his talent, commitment, temperament and ability, he should have drove every ball for a four and a six. Right. But if he had tried doing that, he probably would not have become Sachin Tendulkar. Mm. Now, ordinary investor and a fund manager like us, we are not Sachin Tendulkars. Neither we have ability, nor we have temperament, nor we have talent, nor we have, you know, God's gift to us. Mm. We are ordinary people. We have to spend time on the pitch to make run. If, we are, if our wicket remains not out, we'll get a half folly which we can hit for a four and six. Mm. So it is important in this kind of market where valuations are between fair to fair value plus level, you increase your time horizon. Mm. You go for compounding rather than multi-bagger. Right. Instead of finding a stock which is going to go up five times in one year, it's far better to invest in a stock which is going to give you 15% compounded return for five years. Mm. So, in effect, you're also arguing for SIPs, right? Because effectively, Tendulkar's dot ball is uh, putting in money right now. But uh, maybe if the market's correct, yeah. uh, you'll get that opportunity. That SIP will become a six. Absolutely. At Kotak Mutual Fund, we celebrated SIP day. Mm. And this is after the industry is receiving about one crore SIPs, giving them about 3,000 crore worth of monthly inflow. And our target was to go and reach out to that segment of population uh, which, uh, you know, ether to hasn't accessed uh, mutual fund or capital market. Mm. And we were amazed to see in firemen's, in dabbawalas, in postmen's, uh, in ordinary citizens, complete lack of awareness about uh, equity market, a complete lack of awareness about capital market. And for them, SIP is a fantastic tool. It allows you to invest at every level of market and over a period of time, market compounding will work, work wonder for them. So my recommendation to ordinary investors will be please use SIP in equity mutual funds, mm. allow professional managers to manage their money. Mm. And of course, it will come with the risk of volatility, little bit of downside, period of uh, stagnation. Mm. But over a period of time, the growth of India and the growth of capital market will produce return in SIP, which will be far better than what you will get in fixed income or gold or probably real estate. So just to continue with the kind of macro theme, I'm just taking the point that you're making, that at a time when equity markets look expensive, it's also at a similar moment when, uh, uh, you know, fixed income, interest rates are declining globally. So that makes it even more important to be in equities, right? Definitely. Now, uh, 
I, I, I met a high net worth individual investor uh, whose entire portfolio is fixed deposits. Mm. And he said fixed deposits are safe, fixed deposits are tension free. And you know, when I invest, uh, when I look at mutual fund, it increases my blood pressure. Mm. Now I asked him one simple thing, that sir, when you started investing in fixed deposits, what kind of return you were getting? He said 16, 17, 18. I said, after that, what kind of returns you were getting? He says 13, 14, 15. Mm. I said, after that, what kind of return you get? 10, 11, 12. Today, what return you are getting? 8, 9, 10. Mm. I said, have you wondered why these rates are dropping? Mm. And tomorrow, will you get 4, 5, 6% return? Mm. How can you say fixed deposit is safe when it is exposing you to this reinvestment risk every mm. third, fourth, fifth year? Mm. And then he understood the risk of reinvestment. Mm. Fixed deposit gives you fixed return. But, you know, most people invest in fixed deposits with three-year horizon, five-year horizon. Right. Now, you start at 11% and when you come for renewal, it becomes 5% or 6%. Mm. That's a huge risk. Mm. And in today's world where half of the world is in negative interest rate scenario, mm. you have no option but to allow Indian interest rates to migrate towards lower side. Mm. Uh, with inflation under control, that's probably going to happen which means your fixed income portfolio will be heavily exposed to reinvestment risk. And to balance that, to manage that, you need to invest something in equity. Would you say that the negative interest rate scenario, on the one hand, it uh, indicates uh, a global economic stagnation, but in a sense, it also indicates that finance has completely decoupled and therefore uh, liquidity, central banks will have to and continue to pump liquidity, which will be great for equity markets and emerging markets. Uh, I, I, I really don't understand this negative interest rate scenario. Mm. We haven't been taught about that in school and colleges. Mm. Uh, we tried doing Google search on it. It mm. produces more questions than answers. Mm. Uh, we got one statement from Ben, Banar ben Bananke, then U.S. Fed governor, somewhere in 2007. He said that a negative interest rates ain't going to work. People will keep money at home rather than pay interest and put that into bank deposits. Mm. Uh, in 2014 or 15, there was another statement from the same gentleman and who is an authority on helicopter money, mm. Great Depression. Mm. He said that U.S. Fed should experiment with negative interest rates if mm. required. Mm. Now, if academicians and practitioners like Ben Bernanke does not understand the uh, mm negative interest rates as much and he changes his opinion in less than seven eight years mm. you can imagine what will be the plight of people like us <laughs> we do go and meet a lot of uh, strategists uh, which come from uh, you know foreign background mm. and try to understand from them how in their country negative interest rates are working out mm. and at the end of the day we realize that they are probably also as much in dark as we are mm. so one of the strategists actually told us uh, very nicely that as long as you are aware that you are ignorant about negative interest rate, mm. that itself will become your strength, that itself will become your outperformance vis-a-vis -vis others yeah. who probably has fallen into that uh, false belief that they have understood what negative interest rates are. Mm. Uh, from a limited point of view, as far as India is concerned, we still have positive interest rates, 7% mm. plus on a 10-year government securities, mm. the older benchmarks, not the newer benchmarks. Mm. And uh, we still have room for rates to go down and uh, probably that's going to give a lot of uh, boost or space for our equity valuations mm. as interest rates continue to drop mm. our equity market valuations can continue to rise mm. and if we are in a position to market india to the rest of the world mm. which is at negative interest rate scenario mm. saying that come and invest into indian equity come and invest into indian industry through foreign direct investment and mm. you know you get some red positive return I think we'll have more money than we can absorb and that's going to be positive for our asset price inflation. Is there any kind of an analysis that you've done at Kotak on what is the, let's say, the average cost of financing in the top 500 comp listed companies in India or the top 100 listed companies in India and what impact it can have on their profitability, as, I mean, uh, on their uh, net income if interest rates go down by, let's say, one percentage point or something? At Kotak Mutual Fund, we did a small analysis about uh, interest rate sensitivity of Indian corporate mm. and removing the banks and financial uh, services industry. 
uh, one percent drop in interest rate is roughly giving seven percent increase in corporate profitability. Seven percent. That yes. That's a, that's not seven percentage point, right? I'm, I'm assuming that's a seven percent on that. So if uh, profitability was let's say uh, 100 crore was the profit of one particular company, it, its uh, profit goes up to 107. That's what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Wow, that's that's a big difference, right? That's a big difference. The second study which we did and uh, which was more driven by you know our desire to figure out how organized sector access to lending can change unorganized sector mm -hmm. so we realized that a uh, lot of unorganized sector in small and medium enterprises mm -hmm. in uh, you know vegetable vendors fruit vendors auto wallas they all pay exorbitant rate of interest on their borrowing even in urban india right. uh, many vegetable vendors of mumbai pays 20 to 40 percent per day, not per annum, per day by way of interest. When Autowala hires an auto, he's probably paying some 3,600 percent per annum interest by way of rental charges. Mm. Uh, so there is a huge unorganized sector of uh, India mm. who has access to very, very high cost borrowing. Mm. And if that sector can be given organized sector financing mm. at say 12, 15, 18, 24, 30 percent interest rate, mm while 24 and 30 per annum will look very, very high. Mm. That is what they are paying on a per day basis. Right. And that excess can really improve their financial condition significantly. Mm. And that could in turn create a growth opportunity for the entire economy. Mm. So interest rates coming down for the organized sector is one portion, mm. but interest rates coming down for unorganized sector mm. will have far more benevolent impact. Mm. It's almost you're arguing for almost an MFI and in the urban space, right? Maybe microfinance in Mumbai. Absolutely. Something like what Mudra is doing in the banking system, whereby about 3.2 crore small and medium enterprises mm. have been given loans at uh, reasonable rates. Mm. And that makes a big difference. Um, so t the declining, uh, so when we look at FY17, FY18 PEs, I know you were giving a caveat and a warning about looking at PE then in some ways when we say it is expensive, we're not actually taking into account the kind of earnings impact it has, any decline in uh, interest rates has on future earnings, right? Definitely. Mm. Uh, on a broad basis, when we see Indian listed companies' profitability to GDP ratio, it is today at the bottom quartile. It's averaging around 4% of GDP. Mm. Average could be around 6% of GDP. So there is a suppressed profitability for corporate India, yeah. partly driven by tight liquidity situation, higher real interest rates, lack of probably demand at the private sector, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Now we believe, and first caveat will be that we have been wrong in predicting earnings revival mm -hmm. for last three years. Mm -hmm. Almost for 10 quarters, we were saying that earnings will revive, but that has not yet happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like a broken record saying that, no, no, it's now going to happen in next quarter. Mm. The good part is that the March 16 quarter and June 16 quarter at least has shown positive earnings growth mm. in our universe. Mm. And those are in double digit plus. Mm. We believe going forward, earnings will have to revive, partly mm. driven by one. The government is on the front foot in terms of spending money, courtesy oil price bonanza. Yeah. Second, foreign direct investment is at its peak and that's going to create second layer impact in India. Mm. Third, after two years of below average monsoon, this year monsoon has been fantastic. Mm. The spatial distribution is something which we haven't seen in many, many years. Mm. So rural economy will get revived because of good monsoon. Mm. Fourth, RBI has started providing liquidity to the banking system. Yeah. Between 2010 to 2016, RBI was constraining liquidity banks were borrowing on the overnight window virtually every day but today the system is in surplus mm. so money will flow into credit over a period of time mm. and finally we will see earnings growth coming through as these companies have actually cut cost over last two three years of tough period mm. so all these factors put together should continue to you know this sustained momentum built in March 16 quarter and June 16 quarter.
And you were saying that uh, we are now at about 4 to 4.5 percent of GDP is profitability, and you, the average is close to 6 percent. So there's that 150 basis Absolutely. point uh, expansion that can take place. Absolutely. All right. Um, you know, just as I asked you about the uh, sens rate sensitivity impact, is there any study that you've done on operating leverage? I know that's much more difficult and much more wide question I'm asking, but even if you've done it specific to some sectors, we would be very interested to know about that. Uh, I'll have to admit that my colleague uh, Harish will be far more competent to answer that question. Okay. But I'm just uh, relaying what I learned from him. Hmm. So he manages our Kotak Infrastructure and Economic Reform Fund. Hmm. And uh, clearly from 2008 to 2015, infrastructure sector really paid heavy price for debt, for slowdown in private investments, for certain government policies which kind of constrained that uh, sector in terms of environmental clearances and so on and so forth. Mm. Now in that kind of scenario when Harish started managing this fund, he focused on operating leverage companies. Mm. We invested in those companies where we believe operating leverage will kick in mm. as and when growth revives. Mm. So we picked up uh, bearings companies, we picked up engine companies, we picked up component companies mm. where they cut the cost to become competitive and then they started using exports market to fill their surplus capacity mm. and they were a very very good play mm. for the ultimate revival in you know private sector investment mm. now private sector investment got delayed a little bit so we moved towards the government spending mm. government was spending on roads railways defense and component supplier to this sectors provided that ideal operating leverage mm. so clearly there are sectors where operating leverage comes into play. This are essentially related to capital goods, component makers, infrastructure plays. But what is extremely critical is time taken for leverage to come into play. Mm. There's no point in investing in company where operating leverage is going to come after five or six years. Mm. You might invest in those companies where operating leverage will start kicking in, mm. albeit gradually on a piecemeal basis mm. from let's say 12, 18, 24 months onwards. Mm. So would you say that uh, you know, capital goods companies which uh, supply to uh, infrastructure, like let's say power and things like that, is still five years away in terms of operating leverage to kick in? And taking specifically power, for uh, instance. Within, within power, you'll have to make adjustments for renewable power versus thermal power. Right. Uh, we have expanded our solar capacity by almost 80%. Mm. We used to hear that China, you know, grows a sector by 50%, 100%, 200%. Mm. Now we are seeing that happening in the solar power side. Mm. In the wind power side also, while the growth is far more muted compared to solar power, there is fair amount of, uh, you know, growth there. The thermal power obviously is under trouble. It's mm. not growing as much. The capacity utilization itself is at 65, 70%. So new mm. capacities are not going to come in a hurry. Mm. Then there is a derivative to the power sector, which could be transmission lines. Yeah. We moved from 35,000 kilometers a year to 50,000 kilometers a year. Mm. There is also another component which is riding on power. And I will include that in power sector like LED lighting. Right. I mean, clearly government is focused on distributing LED lights. Mm -hmm. So instead of going for conventional power, like, like let's say thermal, mm. you focus on people who are supplying components to solar power, mm. to wind power, mm. to LED lights, mm. to transmission. I think that play will give a better return or better outperformance mm. over thermal power play. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, talking about sectors and operating leverage, I just want to pick your brains on cement because that's one place where we've seen uh, a lot of um, operating leverage kicking in, uh, their capacity utilization has gone up, consolidation taking place, demand going up, but it's also a place where we're seeing a little bit of government intervention. I mean, we saw not necessarily government, but the state, CCI, uh, the Competition Commission imposing these fines. We saw that in the, uh, Assam, the Chief Minister, Mr. Sonowal, has called these PA, uh, manufacturers and asked them, why have you raised prices? So what is your uh, take on the cement space right now? I think in terms of CCI case, it will be a matter of court. Yeah. I'm sure industry players are going to go, uh, you know, uh, oppose that. 
So I will leave it over there. Mm. Uh, the rule of law has to prevail. If mm. industry has done anything wrong, they'll have to pay the price. Mm. If they have done things right, then obviously they don't have to pay the price. Mm. But from our point of view, cement is a fantastic commodity. Mm. One, the time taken to set up new cement plant has almost extended from three years to six years. Uh, you need uh, time to acquire land for mining. You need time to acquire land for setting up cement company. Mm and then environmental and pollution clearance and so on and so forth. Mm. So the pace of capacity addition in cement uh, is going to be far more restricted vis-a-vis -vis what say it was in the past. Mm. In fact, we have seen a one particular year, if I'm not wrong, in 2003 or 2004, we added a 50 million ton cement capacity. Mm. And in last five, and over next five, six years, probably we are not going to add 50 million ton cement capacity. Mm. Mm. The second thing is related to consolidation in the sector. While uh, someone can say that it kind of concentrates pricing power in the hands of manufacturers, right. I will say that it actually allows people to optimize their logistic solutions. Mm. The logistic cost is very, very high for cement sector. Mm. Our average track, truck runs 284 kilometers a day. Mm. If we can improve roads, if we can increase the strength of the truck, and if we can remove the toll roads through RFID tags, mm. then probably the speed will increase, reduce the logistic cost. Mm. Uh, more plants across India will also allow manufacturer to distribute logistics cost properly. Mm. So consolidation of sector is resulting into lower logistical cost. And without raising prices, companies can increase their margin. Mm. The third thing is related to demand for cement. Mm. I mean, clearly, cement roads are picking up. The government itself for national highways picked up about 10 million tons of cement. Mm. The infrastructure development which is happening in the country, albeit with a little bit of delay, mm. is going to keep on increasing demand for cement. Mm. The housing sector is something where government has promised house for all by 2022. Right. Now that's going to create demand for cement. Mm. Supply of cement is restricted through imports. It has to be met through local consumption. Mm. And all this combination gives a great advantage for cement companies. The demand is assured, imports are unlikely to happen, mm. operating leverage is kicking in, new capacities are not going to come in. Mm. And as long as they are able to save on the cost uh, through energy, through efficient mm. logistics, mm. their margins will go up and the customers will also benefit. Mm. Okay, let me come to two sectors which are a little un in trouble. And one, I'll start with telecom. Now, with the new uh, entrant, it has completely disrupted that space and uh, you know we saw the impact but then uh, bharti kind of picked up again without asking specifically about stocks what is your take on what is going to happen and how long this pain will continue uh, my simple answer is that when elephants are dancing it's far better to watch from outside rather than inside there are many other options to you as an investor mm. let the doubts get cleared about this sector Mm. how the pricing is going to play out, mm. how the customer behavior is going to shift, and what's going to be response from uh, incumbents versus the you know, new player. Mm. Uh, there's no hurry to rush into this uh, sector. Let things get sorted out. Maybe you'll end up paying a little higher price from entry point of view, mm. but that price is worth paying from certainty point of view. Mm -hmm. So, would you, do, if someone's watching right now and they hold telecom stocks, what would your advice be to them? Uh, my recommendation will be that since you are already in mm. and you have taken the pain of investment in telecom sector, continue with it. Mm. Market today obviously has discounted all the apparent news. Mm. As a new investor, mm. I want to wait for certainty to, to emerge okay. and I will make fresh investments after that. Mm. But you are already invested, you have already taken the pain, you have already taken the plunge. Mm. Now don't vacate it, just mm. stay, hold on to it. I'm, I'm going to, my final question will be on that about holding on. But before that, I just want to ask you about India's IT sector, IT services sector. Uh, but I, if one looks at something like Infosys, and this is what I, uh, this is a question that I always ask the brains in the market is that the cash it has, the kind of uh, business growth it has and the multiple it's trading at, it looks pretty attractive from the outside. But uh, you had a caveat for banking that, you know, technology change can completely disrupt it. Do you think that that disruption point has already come for Indian IT? Undoubtedly, at least uh, 
I don't know from a business point of view, but certainly from a market point of view, market is worried about sustenance of growth in IT sector. In market's understanding, Indian IT companies are overweight towards that part of the business where they have provided bodies which are doing work which can be easily replicated by artificial intelligence. Mm. It may not happen overnight, but certainly it can happen over next four, five, six years. Mm. So market is worried that where your bulk of business is coming mm. is vulnerable to technological threat. Mm. There is a small portion of uh, revenue which is coming from activities like consulting, like products, mm. like uh, new, you know digital side of the business, which is growing at a rapid pace where artificial intelligence and technological disruptions will be limited. In fact, they may create a vehicle for technological disruptions. Mm -hmm. Now, market today is trying to give value to that company who is able to increase this side of the pot at a faster pace mm -hmm. vis-a-vis decline in their existing businesses. Mm -hmm. Now, in the IT sector, the advantage is that valuations are very, very cheap. Mm -hmm. Governance, by and large, has been fantastic. Mm -hmm. and few companies will definitely be able to make that transition from routine normal businesses to exciting fast growing businesses in digital space, in gaming space, in product space, in consulting space. Mm. Companies which can make these transitions will be a great winner for shareholders mm. and uh, I hope that you know for the sake of this country as well as for shareholders mm. most of our Indian IT companies should make that transition mm. but in reality few will be able to make it so there are two questions if you're a new uh, entrant you would say that uh, wait for a while before taking a call on IT right undoubtedly and if but you hold it already you know, then please don't be zero invest in please don't be zero investment in IT mm. these are all great companies available at very very good valuations mm compared to their historical levels because their growth has slowed down, valuations have come down. Mm. So keep an underweight on IT, but don't be completely out of IT. And if you already hold it, you would say then hold on, right? You have, you have taken the pain. Uh, as long as and you are underweight it. IT mm. vis-a-vis mm. benchmark index, mm -hmm. then you know just stay invested. Mm. But be aware that the companies in which you have invested mm. should be making headway in terms of digital space, gaming space, product space, consulting mm. space, uh, basically the newer variety of technology compared mm. to their old stable, uh, you know, uh, variety of technology. Mm. Okay, one final question, and that's why I was asking you whether they should sell, is how difficult is it uh, for a person like you with so much experience to actually sell any of the uh, counters where you've invested? I mean, not you, but where... Kotak has invested? So, as a fund house, we sell in two kind of scenarios. One, when investors put redemptions, you know, I have no option but to sell. I can only invest without leverage in my fund. So, even, you know, at the bottom of October 2008, uh, when people were putting redemptions in my fund, we used to call them, we used to request them not to get unnerved by the huge corrections and losses on their portfolio and stay invested. But if they exercise the decision of redeeming, then we had no option but to sell, even though at the bottom of the heart we thought this is probably a great opportunity. On the other hand, uh, there are times when we have to sell the company because we believe, one, there is a governance related issue mm. and we are not sure whether as a minority shareholder it makes sense for us to continue with that company. Mm. Now I may become from overweight to underweight mm. or I may exit completely mm. but governance related issues are something which really drives us. Mm. The second thing is related to relative valuation. Mm. I am invested in stock A but I find that now stock B probably is going to give me better risk adjusted return. Mm. It need not be absolutely high return mm. but relative to risk which I am taking the return potential could be higher. Mm. In that kind of scenario, we make a switch. Mm. So my sell is determined by governance related issues mm. or attractive opportunities in other sectors or other companies. A dividend payout would also be part of that uh, redemption part, right? Because I'm assuming you can't really pay dividend from the money, um, capital you've raised. Yes. So whenever we declare dividend, mm. obviously we have to raise cash. But uh, what we have realized in our equity funds, uh, 
there is a lot of investment in growth plan where people just continue to remain invested. There is a fair amount of proportion in dividend reinvestment plan. So the actual dividend payouts are a fraction of our total fund size. How often have you felt terrible after selling something and saying that just couldn't re-enter and this was a wrong decision to sell it? Oh, so we have made that mistake uh, throughout our career. Mm. Uh, we are also a human being. Yeah. And uh, typically when you sell a stock, mm. uh, the natural human tendency is that I will buy only if it falls below my selling price. Mm. And uh, which is why I have to always request my portfolio managers mm. that when you are evaluating a portfolio, mm. don't look at the cost of acquisition. Mm. Just mm. look at the current portfolio and current market price. Mm. It doesn't matter what price you bought that stock. It doesn't matter what price we have sold that stock. Mm. We have to look at today's price, today's valuation and start our inning every day. Mm. It's easier to say, it's very difficult to do, mm. but that's where the maker and checker kind of concept comes into play. Mm. Portfolio managers are human, they have their emotions, they have their greed and fear. Mm. But if you know there is someone on top of it mm. who can provide a risk management framework mm. who can take their emotions out and without emotions rationally can say that look this is the way things needs to be looked at. Mm. It does give them little bit of thinking power, it gives them a sounding board and that helps them generate better performance. Mm. Alright, thank you so much. Uh, this, all the things that you said are of great uh, use I think to people who want to directly invest in the markets but uh, I'm sure the smarter viewer is going to be putting their money into mutual funds where people like you are handling it for them. Thanks a lot, Nilesha. Special, uh, very, very, uh, Thank uh, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. It was a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.